Happy Wednesday, everybody. I've got a riddle for you, or maybe more of a conundrum. What happens when trans influencers start complaining about a lack of gender roles? Take a listen to this beautiful it. I feel like a lot of boys need to start being boys, though. Like, when it comes to, like, the male roles. Because a lot of, like, men nowadays are expecting princess treatment. And it's like, okay, well... I want that energy just as much as but just as bad as you do. I want off this planet. We all want off this planet. Plus, later on in the show, we're gonna discuss climate activists going after the Mona Lisa, what is going on. And don't go away because we're going to also discuss a diaper spa that has opened in New Hampshire. If you're interested, it caters to adult baby diaper lovers. Am I reading that correctly? I think I am. All that and more today coming up on Candace Owens. All right, everybody, I've been very honest. I was spanked growing up. I got spankings the whole time, scary spankings. My mom used to throw shoes at us, and then if she missed, she'd make us bring the shoe back to her. That's scary stuff. You know, you're like a kid, like, bring it back, I miss. And then you're just kind of trying to dodge your mom and be like, oh, gosh, how am I going to hand her the shoe but also run away because that shoe's coming at me. And, yeah, so I'm from Generation. Your kids got whooped. Suddenly, obviously, that doesn't happen anymore. And I think that we are seeing really what the product of We're harvesting the kids right now that were never spanked. I see things sometimes, and I am not promoting that you should beat your kids. I don't beat mine. But I do see things sometimes happening in society that just makes me wonder, what if some of these kids did get spanked? For example, over at the Louvre in France, the Mona Lisa, obviously, it was a painting from Leonardo da Vinci, 1507, 1503, whatever it was. Look at these climate activists when they saw this wonderful historic piece of art. Now look, I don't speak French and I have no idea what it is that they are saying, but I do know that that is absolutely unacceptable in a society, you can't even imagine if people doing that in a civilized society. Now, to be clear, obviously, it's the Mona Lisa, and because of its worth, it is behind some glass. We've been seeing these sort of climate protests happening, especially all throughout Europe, where people are not protesting. We're using that word way too loosely. Obviously, what that is, is it's an act of vandalism, and it's costing these cities, it's costing these museums tons of money. And you wonder, why are they doing this? Why are they continuing to do this? Well, it's because they're obviously getting a slap on the wrist. They understand that there really is no harsh penalties that are happening to them. The majority of these individuals get delayed sentencing, are ordered to pay some form of a ridiculous restitution, have to wait six months while they're on probation, maybe, and then they're back on their way. And it's getting more obnoxious, by the way. They're starting to sit down in the middle of streets, blocking people from getting to work. You may have seen clips of this where people that are understandably very angry and upset, cab drivers get out and they're starting to physically move these protesters because, again, this is not a protest. What gives somebody the right to stop you from getting to work to feed your family, to make you late for an hour uh, showing up to work so that you can't clock in because they're upset about the climate crisis? They have no right. There is no punishments. But I weigh this against uh, what's happening in the United States as well. We don't have as many of these climate ridiculous protests here. But I weigh it against what has happened here. It brings me back to the BLM summer of love. Who could forget the summer of love? I love this still of them trying to convince us that it was a mostly peaceful protest. This is real, by the way. CNN, that is the headline. Fiery but mostly peaceful protests after police shooting. And yeah, emphasis on the fiery. Obviously, we know they just kind of burned America down. And this is what happened. The media rushed to essentially say to everyone that was participating in this criminality that it was totally totally okay. We have your back. I will give you the numbers just in a couple of weeks from May 25th until June 8th. It cost anywhere between one to two billion dollars nationally. The vandalism, the looting, that is how much it cost our nation. And yet, as I said, you had judges, you had celebrities, you had an entire ecosystem that told these kids it's okay because you have a feeling. 
Who could forget? I always bring it up because we should never forget this. Those two Ivy League lawyers out of New York City. Do you remember them? Their names were, are rather, Aruj Rahman and Collinford Mattis. Collinford Mattis, young black man, was well, very well accomplished, graduated from Princeton University. He was well on his way working at a fancy law firm called Pryor Cashman in the city. Also, and I'm going to say strangely, uh, had three foster children. I find that to be strange only because of the arguments that they later made in court about his depressive condition and the fact that he was an alcoholic, which led him to text his friend. Her name was Aruj Rahman. She also similarly had graduated from Fordham University. She got her, her law degree. And they just started texting each other, talking about how they just wanted to do hood rat stuff as friends, right? Specifically, she texted to him, I hope they burn everything down. This is following the death of George Floyd. Need to burn down all the police stations, probably all the courts too. This is a real text exchange, a text exchange between two people that are out of law school, Ivy League law schools. She also wrote to him, throwing bottles and tear gas, lit some fires, but were put out fireworks going and Molotovs rolling. And when she said Molotovs rolling, she meant that. She really meant that because they linked up together. And here is one of the classic photos of them that ended up getting them in trouble. Uh, they just picked up some beer bottles and created some Molotov cocktails, went on a little ride and decided to torch a New York police department police car. They threw the Molotov cocktail in there. Thankfully, there was no police officer in the cruiser, so nobody got hurt. But yeah, this could have been homicidal. So you're going, of course, obviously, they got in tons of trouble. This would have been an act of terrorism anywhere else where we believed in rules, where we believed in regulations, where we believed that you shouldn't just be allowed to casually try to kill police officers. But no, I remember they were arrested and then they were released and we were just going, what on earth is going on here? Well, I now would like to update you on what has happened in that case. They downgraded the charges. At first, they were looking at 10 years, again, for terrorist actions. But they just said because of extenuating circumstances, that being the fact that George Floyd died in Minnesota, we have to be understanding of what these two lawyers were going through emotionally. And so instead, prosecutors recommended that they receive max two years. And don't you worry, because they didn't get those two years. Aruj Rahman was sentenced to 15 months in prison last November, and they also requested time served for her, followed by a year of supervised release. And you're not going to believe what the judge said to her when he sentenced her. He said, quote, you're a remarkable person who did a terrible thing on one night. Ah, oh, so loving. You just, we all get a little crazy when we're watching the news. We all call up our homies and we're just like, hey, let's just throw a Molotov cocktail into police cruiser because we're emotional. And that's totally understandable, says this judge. Just, it's just a bad night. Just having a bad night. Similarly, for our friend Collinford Mattis, when the judge handed down his sentence, he told him that it wasn't his fault, you know, but he wasn't the one egging it on. It was really the girl's fault. But don't forget, also, she's a remarkable person. So you get it. This is just a slap on the wrist. There's no trouble, of course, if you are boycotting, emphasis, or protesting any form of criminal activity as long as you are doing what the state sanctions, what the state wants you to see. And obviously, we understood that there was very much a conspiracy, a federal conspiracy, to further the George Floyd riots just ahead of another election. Now, why am I telling you this? Because I want you to weigh this in contrast to something that just took place actually here in Tennessee. And I'm not ashamed that it took place in Tennessee because the Tennessee state wasn't involved at all. Instead, the feds got involved when six pro-life actual protesters decided to peacefully protest outside of a clinic. Do you want to know what they did? It's horrific. Why would the feds get involved? Would they throw a Molotov cocktail? No. Did they hurt somebody? No. They sang hymns. Take a listen. Oh, You know what I heard? I heard 
I'll ask the question, did that scare you? Were you terrified for your life when they were singing the hymns? Well, Biden's Department of Justice certainly got wind of this and decided that something had to be done. And so what they did is they sent the FBI yep, to make sure that these individuals were arrested. Here is footage of one of those arrests of a young man named Paul Vaughn. This took place in Centerville, Tennessee. The DOJ eventually charged him with conspiracy against rights secured by the FACE Act. Take a look at this footage. But if you're not going to let me, then I'll just- No, I want to know why you were banging on my door with a gun. You're not going to tell me anything? I, you, I, I, I tried. Man. No, you didn't. Yes, did. You did not try. So you just imagine that. You're a wife. Your husband went down and sang some hymns because he is pro-life at the clinic. And the next thing you know, you've got feds banging on the door to arrest him. And they've got guns. I mean, what does the situation have to be in order to imagine having your door banged on and looking at federal officers carrying guns. I don't know what the situation would need to be, but in my mind, it definitely doesn't seem appropriate for Christians singing hymns outside of a clinic where they are about to murder unborn children and rip them limb from limb. I don't know, but that's, this is Biden's DOJ, and they have appointed a person, Kristen Clark, if you're not familiar with her. She is the DOJ's Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. And she is the person that is very proud to oversee the prosecution of what is known as the FACE Act. That stands for Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act. And she has been very clear that anybody that she deems hostile to her pro-baby killing spree is going to have to face the Department of Justice. So that, my friends is how your tax day, your tax paying dollars are being spent, right? When you wonder, my gosh, we just have so many federal agents. They're saying we should have even more federal agents. I, I'm just amazed at what they choose to prosecute, who they choose to handhold, what they deem to be dangerous, what they deem to be something that is worthy of their attention, and what they don't. That's just food for thought, guys. That's all I'm going to say about that. The Candace Owens Podcast is supported by Grand Canyon University, an affordable private Christian university with a vibrant campus in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. Ranked top 20 in the country by Niche.com, GCU is a missional, Christ-centered university that strives to foster a culture of community, giving, and impact. GCU's goal is to help you develop into a servant leader who makes a difference through finding your purpose. With 330 academic programs and over 270 online as of June 2023, GCU integrates the free market system with a welcoming Christian worldview into your bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degree. You'll have support from your own university counselor who takes a personalized approach to helping you achieve your goals. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Visit gcu.edu today. Private, Christian, affordable. Okay, now it's time for some topics du jour. But before we get into those topics, I want to remind you guys, if you are watching this on YouTube, to subscribe to this YouTube channel. We are on the race to 3 million subscribers. Started the show with a bit of a conundrum. What happens when our trans population begins demanding for more gender roles? It's very confusing. There's so many trans influencers out there, whatever that means. And this particular trans influencer uh, exploded onto the scene after appearing on the Whatever podcast. You remember me on that podcast? I was talking to all the hoes. So yeah, they, they foster a lot of interesting conversations. And following that appearance, this trans influencer became something of a mini celebrity. Now, I want to be clear. Uh, I am not sure about the pronouns. So I'm instead going to call this individual Ali Lopez or Ali Lopez. And here is what um, Lopez has to say about the decline of masculinity. This is so tricky, YouTube. Can you just make my life easier? Take it away, Lopez. I also love when, like, there is a little bit of, like, a a little bit of a gender role in a relationship. I don't, I don't, I'm not a big fan of toxic masculinity or, like, whatever, like, the the norms, I guess. But I like when there's just, like, a little bit of that, 
like I'm the man and I'm going to take charge, you know, like because like, why not? You know, I feel like a lot of boys need to start being boys, though, like when it comes to like the male roles, because a lot of like men nowadays are expecting princess treatment. And it's like, OK, well, I want that energy just as much as but just as bad as you do. For example, like, let's say I get a flat tire on the side of the road and we're together. You better know how to change that tire. Like, you better know how to do these things. Because if I have to call my dad, just like I said, no, no. Sorry. Sorry, babe. I don't know what's happening out there, uh, ladies and gents, if I may say ladies and gents. But it's interesting. It's an interesting conundrum. As I said, when you have trans people that are acknowledging that there are gender roles. And I think it always just brings me to a question for people that say gender is fluid, that there's no concept, or gender, gender is a social construct, right? That's what we're supposed to be saying now. That's the new orthodoxy. Can I ask the question what it is that you are transitioning to if gender is a social construct? Like if you are a biological male and you don't think that there's such a thing as female and male, what are you transitioning to? What is the idea that you are transitioning toward? Don't you have to acknowledge that there are differences and that gender and sex are real if you do aspire to transition. Again, I'm just asking questions because it's getting pretty kooky out there. And I just think that all of these social media companies who are honoring this thought process really have their work cut out ahead of them because they just must be scrambling when every day, every thought that a person has has to be affirmed and has to be acknowledged. Like Lopez is amazing thought process that's happening here. But listen, hey, hey, Lopez, we agree on one thing. We are um, definitely facing a crisis when it comes to masculinity. It's a larger conversation to be had, a lot of things that are contributing to that. It is a fact that testosterone rates have dropped significantly over the last few decades. And I think that that is intentional. I think it's what is in the water. I believe it's in our food and that there is a reason, that there is a severe evil effort to make sure that we can't defend ourselves. And there is no society that can survive without strong men. And I don't think anybody would deem Ali Lopez to be an example of a strong man or woman or whatever Ali Lopez feels. They, I'm going to get in trouble, so I'm just going to stop talking. I'm going to stop talking and I'll move on to the next story. But you know what? Further to that point, I'm just going to add this here as an honorable mention. You may have seen um, in the news last night that there was a pretty disturbed young man who went onto YouTube after allegedly beheading his father and had the head of his father on YouTube for six hours before it was taken down. And I, I am just constantly trying to figure out what the heck these YouTube policies are that you might be able to stay on their platform for six hours with an actual human head of your father in your lap, allegedly. Um, but I, I just, I can't say gay. I can hardly say gay. I got to be so careful in what I say here. Don't misgender anybody. Maybe priorities. I don't know. I don't know. I'm moving on. I am moving on, ladies and gentlemen. And we are moving into New Hampshire. You know, spas. I love spas. Don't you love spas? You can get a facial at a spa. You can get a massage at a spa. Don't normally think, yay, I need a diaper. And I want to be in a diaper to deal with my trauma. Remember yesterday we were talking about, you know, mental health as a category uh, what exactly are these doctors doing? What exactly are these psychotherapists doing and saying to individuals other than just affirming them? You know, when I was growing up, we used to acknowledge that crazy was crazy. That was totally fine to say this individual is insane. Um, and I guess before I was growing up, they used to even have insane ins asylums. But now that we don't have insane asylums, we have to instead create spas. And as I mentioned, this particular spa is a diaper spa in New Hampshire, and they specifically cater to adults. And I want to tell you what this diaper spa website has listed. It says they are the only physician-owned diaper spa in the world. And what does that make you think? Physician-owned. This means that these people are qualified. These are the experts. These are the professionals. Um, and they decided that it would be a good thing for them to open a clinic, a spa rather, where people who like to wear diapers, adults who like to wear diapers can seek acceptance and care 
and the space is decorated to look like a baby's nursery, complete with small beds and toys and folded diapers. And they have all sorts of therapeutic support and life coaching and 24-hour stay, which is called the Diaper B&B. And all clients are actually required to wear adult diapers because they want to make sure everybody else feels accepted. Um, yeah, the owner of the spa, her name is Colleen Ann Murphy. And she says that the services, by the way, in case you're like, whoa, what's going on here? That sounds like a fetish. No, she says it's non-sexual and they do not cater to any fetish. They instead cater to individuals looking to regress and to heal. And it helps them process whatever trauma it was that they have gone through throughout their life. She says, quotes, a lot of times it's childhood trauma when they were in diapers or just getting out of diapers and they want to feel that safety that they had before that. And so they just, they're adults that want to be put back into diapers and they strongly affirm these adults. Now, you might be shocked to hear this, but there are some neighbors who are opposing this spa. Imagine living around the corner and there's just a bunch of adults, got a man in a diaper who needs his hand held by a physician. You might think, I don't know if I really feel comfortable with my children being around the corner from these people. If you are a practical thinking, logical thinking human being, you might be thinking that. Uh, but they say it's not a problem. Nothing weird about the fact that these adult people want to be in diapers at all doesn't matter that your kids are around them. And I'm willing to bet if you give it enough time, this will be given a fancy name. They will say that you are bigoted if you don't understand what these adults are going through in their diapers. It's traumatic. There's nothing wrong with these people. And if you raise your eyebrow and say, that looks like a crazy person to me, it's going to be because you are, in fact, just not an individual that is accepting at all. They'll be protesting you in no time. So I just wanted you to know that if you're interested in learning more about this wonderful spa that is filled with totally sane people and rational human beings and physicians, it is located in New Hampshire, and it is called the Diaper Spa. So something else that we have been discussing on the show is just that there is no talent in Hollywood anymore. There's nothing original in Hollywood anymore. I think we just peaked at Lord of the Rings. I really do. I think we're done with being able to produce good films. And that's the reason, obviously, that people are so upset about Barbie not receiving an Oscar nom. Actually, Barbie got plenty of Oscar noms, but upset about Margot Robbie in particular not being deemed the best lead actress or making the category at all because we have completely lowered the standards of what it means to even produce a good film, what it means to be a good writer. And essentially, we're now in this phase where we just keep redoing what's already been done and what is already great. So get excited, everybody. There is a director, Hollywood director. He's big. His name is Kenya Barris. And he essentially just sort of leans into being black, which means he's allowed to do whatever he wants in Hollywood and you can't question it. Uh, he is the person who created the ABC sitcom called Blackish. And he's now working on a script. Guess what they're going to redo? Get excited. The Wizard of Oz. Yes. Now, I could be okay with this because now I know Dorothy's a criminal and she stole. She stole those red bottoms and Glinda helped her do it and she didn't feel bad. But I'm joking. All jokes aside, how is this happening? Obviously, The Wizard of Oz is a classic movie, but they decided that it needs to be redone. They also are going to redo It's a Wonderful Life. This Kenya Barris is going to do It's a Wonderful Life. And he just feels that it just, these stories just need to be blacker. They need to be black-ish at the very least, which makes me question whether or not he was aware regarding The Wizard of Oz that we did already have a blackish Wizard of Oz. It was called The Wiz, and Michael Jackson was in it. Remember this? Come on down, he's on down, he's on down the road. Come on, he's on down, he's on down the road. I feel like that was blackish enough, but not Kenya. Kenya does not feel like it's blackish enough. We need to make sure that we blackify it even more. And regarding It's a Wonderful Life, he actually said this that. He has plans to have a person of color as the lead. The plot will follow a man who is presented with a guardian angel on Christmas Eve as he battles suicidal thoughts. He said, quote, I think that's the perfect story to tell for a person of color, black or brown, to get into that because our communities have some issues and someone trying to help that community out. I think that's the perfect vehicle to tell that story from. So again, we are constantly being reminded 
um, that black people are suffering. And the best way to do that is to instead of just creating something that's new and interesting and something that people would line up to see if it was interesting and new, we're just going to go back and rewrite things that have already been done. Now, he also has more things uh, on his resume. Kenya Barris made his acting debut in a series called Hashtag Black AF. So diversity is thy name. He thinks it's diversity to just blackify everything. But actually, what I think it is, is a lack of originality. And it makes me sad because black people are tremendously creative. Black people can create art and do wonderful things. But we are constantly kind of being pushed into this box, being pushed into believing that we can't and that what we need to do is find greatness that already exists and make it bad. Because obviously, this movie's not going to be good. Obviously, it's not going to be good. None of these movies are. None of these reboots are good. And it just makes me sad for the state of Hollywood and the state of humanity right now. We're just not very creative. Anyways, you guys, it is now time to jump into some of your comments regarding episodes past. On the topic of therapy, obviously, we were amazed yesterday to learn that these two lesbians were breeding to intentionally make their children deaf. Uh, And then we were even more so shocked to learn that they are psychotherapists. They are in the mental health community, giving people advice for their life. It's me, I, Mag, writes, as a psychotherapist myself, I wholeheartedly agree with what you said here regarding mental health professionals. Most of them just coddle and affirm any feeling the client utters. It is poor therapy and not at all in the client's best interest most of the time. Many therapists would learn a great deal from the great Dr. Peterson, who was a skilled clinician and actually helped a lot of clients face their fears and improve their lives rather than affirm their victimhood. Thanks for this, Candace. Yeah, I do definitely know that there are some good therapists, but I would think as a rule, I'm just putting this out there, I'm speaking off the cuff here, that it's good to actually have a good community of friends and family members that can help you when you're going through things. Like, I just think the category of wanting to pursue a professional, of course, some people don't have that support system at home, don't have sisters, brothers, whatever it is. But as a rule, it's good to just have someone that you can call a friend that can help you think through what you're going through and, and being able to dialogue with yourself as well. But I know that we're, we are so far removed from that right now in society and everyone thinks that they need to seek a professional all the time. Ali writes, clinical social worker here and absolutely love you and Matt's thought process and content. It's my job to help you identify when you are behaving in destructive ways towards yourself or others. You being emotionally dysregulated should not be everyone else's problem and we definitely should not be normalizing illness to this level and everyone shouldn't have a diagnosis. It's okay to feel and have feelings. We are humans. Yes, I think that if I was a psychotherapist, I would have the person sit in the chair and they'd be like, this happened to me and I'd be like, and? And then this, and, and, and. What's the next point? We get it, life happens to people Life is sad, it's depressing, it's exhilarating, it's happy, it's anxiety-inducing, it's all of the things. Welcome to life, welcome to therapy with Candace Owens and Matt Walsh. Linz writes, I'm a therapist in Canada and I agree with your and Matt's sentiments about mental health. It's a lonely place amongst peers who just want to validate, pathologize, and diagnose everything. Everything is a disorder and trauma now and I find it infuriating and disrespectful to people who actually struggle. Well, now there are diaper clinics, diaper spas. Did I say clinic? That makes it sound like these people are crazy. They are not. They are in need of a spa and relaxation. And that is exactly the reason why, because everyone is coddling every person under the sun. A couple of comments regarding Ilhan Omar, my strange defense of her. It wasn't a defense. It was just me saying the truth is we could not find that she said this. People are now asking her to step down. I just don't want to be involved in lies, spreading lies. There's so many things you can get Ilhan Omar on our. We don't need to create things that she didn't actually say. Zach writes, Candice, I 100% agreed with you. I am a Somali journalist and I can confirm what the gentleman said. She never at any point said Somalia first, Muslim second. She simply said, we are people who are courageous, people who know who they are. We are Somali and Muslim. Yeah, I thought it was kind of amazing that everyone instantly understood fluent Somalian on Twitter when this video dropped. And looking further into it, it does seem that because of regional issues, Somalia versus Somaliland, I don't know if I'm saying that right, that the people who created that content basically wanted conservatives to attack her because they don't like her. And like I said, I am not a fan of Ilhan Omar for a million reasons, one of them being that she married her brother, but I am not going to jump in on the chorus of voices who are condemning her for something that she didn't do. It's cheap shots all around. 
El Diablo writes, as a Somali, Candace is right. That's not exactly what Ilhan said. Her words were much more like, we have influence in America. We are taxpayers. And you guys sent your daughter to Congress. Yes, that is what we translated it to be and what somebody else translated it to be. By the way, I love that you guys are commenting because I know that a lot of Somalis watch this show, which is amazing. I actually got a YouTube breakdown of where everybody was watching, and I was just so impressed by how many people in Africa, the entire continent, are watching the show. So thank you guys for tuning in all across the world. And if you are in Somalia right now, hit the subscribe button. Love you guys. Or if you're anywhere else, just hit the subscribe button. But yeah, a lot of you guys are saying... It's not cool to twist people's words. Jared jumped in and said, I can't stand Omar, but it's never right to twist people's words. She is a monster without added miswording of her speeches. Agreed, agreed all around you guys. Again, uh, reminding you to subscribe to the channel if you're watching. That is all the time that we have for today. We will see you tomorrow for a brand new episode.